All right. So hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to yet another um, Green Bank Science Lunch Talk. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. Sangeeta Malhotra, a research astrophysicist um, with the Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, so thank you, Sangeeta, for joining us today. Um, we will be talking about a very uh, cleverly named topic, which is Blue Galaxy. So if everything is good to go on your end, then take it away. Thanks, Jesse. Um, uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be here. That's that's what we say, even though here is here in my uh, at my house. Uh, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, green pea galaxies today. Uh, it is a very clever name, as Jesse said, but I can't take credit for it because green pea galaxies were uh, discovered by citizen scientists, and it's. It's, it's been, and I got into it because um, uh, many reasons. One reason was a high schooler showed up in, in my office and wanted to be an intern. And I thought, okay, if this, this has been done with citizen science and there's archival data everywhere, uh, how hard it, can it be for a high schooler? So, but then pretty soon, um, thanks to him, uh, a lot of people, including myself, got sucked in. So, uh, but it's it's been great fun uh, because of the way it came about. So, um, but um, let me just back up and talk about um, stuff that you know uh, a lot of people talk about in very very serious tones. Not like me. If, if you wish, I can put on earphones. Yeah. Oh. Uh, you know, not uh, funny jokes or silly names, but uh, reanization, uh, something that happened uh, in the first billion years of uh, uh, the universe's history where galaxies formed stars and made their mark on the gas around them. So, uh, but we were talking about small silly galaxies, but we'll connect them to reanization. So, um, Let's proceed. Um, I hope I can do this. Hello. Okay. So, one of the things uh, I've been obsessed with for the past twenty or so years is uh, these things called Lyman Alpha galaxies, where we actually see the most, uh, the strongest. Uh, hydrogen emission line in the UV uh, coming from galaxies. And what, and the surprise there is you do see them coming out from galaxies. Uh, and it's surprising because they're supposed to be resonantly scattered. So people are like, what are Lyman alpha galaxies? Uh, and the question is, is that a galaxy that makes Lyman alpha photons? And no, all star forming galaxies that are You've done star formation, there's still neutral gas around and you are expecting to have recombinations and Lyman alpha photons, as well as other recombination photons. So all star formation galaxies do that. The question is Lyman alpha galaxies are the ones where Lyman alpha photons escape so we can observe them. So then the question is how much of the Lyman alpha is escaping? How does it escape? What are the what are the conditions that let Lyman alpha escape? And that's the question about Lyman alpha galaxies. And at some point, you know, wow. So what are the properties of these galaxies that are distinctive? I'll try not to swear as uh, PowerPoint doesn't do what I expect it to do. So, uh, sorry. So we've been studying uh, what makes Lyman alpha galaxies, uh, what they are and uh, what are the distinctive properties uh, that let Lyman alpha escape. And then we've also been doing, uh, you know, how can we use Lyman alpha galaxies uh, as diagnostics for reionization? Uh, and this is mostly high redshift work and uh, 
to understand the physics of Lyman alpha escape, but there's also very good indications that Lyman alpha galaxies are good sources of ionizing radiation. Um, it is an unsolved problem uh, somewhat. How do ionizing radiations escape from galaxies? A lot of the nearby galaxies that were expected to be good Lyman continuum leakers were found. We didn't see Lyman continuum escaping from them. And both these problems are related because similar physical conditions promote both escapes. You don't want a lot of neutral gas in the way. And what people want to do, you know, uh, is solve these problems at high redshifts. What made the universe ionized? What kind of galaxies were they? How did the, uh, what did they do? How did they do it? What did they look like? And this is what we want to know about galaxies at the reionization epoch. Luminosity functions as in the distribution of uh, how many galaxies uh, and how bright uh, the masses of those galaxies, star formation histories, gas inflows, outflows, environments, what triggered star formation, what are the kinematics of uh, the gas inside the galaxies, what's happening in the interstellar medium, what's happening in the circumgalactic medium, what are the ionization states, what's clumping, Lyman alpha escape, Lyman continuum escape, metallicities, all of this stuff. This is what we want to know about galaxies at the reionization epoch. And this is what we know about galaxies at the reionization epochs. We can know their luminosity functions, like what's the distribution of galaxies as a function of brightness? How many do we have per unit volume? So that's what we know. And the attempt is, can we find that local analog? Can we, can we really, really, pretty please, can we find those local analogs? And um, one of the things I'll try to convince today is that green peas are like the high redshift Lyman alpha galaxies, uh, uh, high redshifts. And um, so I'll, I'll go through some of the spiel for that and what we found about First, I'll try to convince you that green peas are like high redshift Lyman alpha galaxies. And then I'll show some of the properties we've been studying about them. And then I'll come to the 21 centimeter observations done with green, uh, green bank telescopes in collaboration with Tavasi uh, Ghosh and others. And that's where we land. So, oh. So this is what we can learn about local analog galaxies. And we are very excited to have local analog galaxies. And let's see, um, I'll skip a little bit about Lyman alpha galaxies. So what are green peas? Green pea galaxies were selected by citizen scientists. You know, there was this huge galaxy zoo morphology classification project. And one of the side things that came out is people started talking about, what are these things that look round and green and like peas? So what happens is they appear green because there's a strong oxygen-free emission line at 5007 angstroms, and they are round because they are small and unresolved. And what this implies about these galaxies is that they are very young populations, starburst, high ionization, low metallicities, and that's the optical spectrum. That's what the near UV imaging with uh, HST looks like, and that's what the near UV spectrum looks like for Lyman alpha line. Then uh, we started looking at some of the archival Lyman alpha data and a spectroscopy, uh, UV spectroscopy done with HST. And we found uh, very, very interesting things. And uh, at the same time, uh, Elena Henry and I'll published these things. So it, it kind of came out together. So I'm going to talk about both the papers mixing and matching. So these galaxies have low stellar masses. They have lowish star formation rates, um, not very much dust. Um, and the important, 
important thing is that the equivalent width distribution of the lime and alpha line uh, for the green peas is pretty comparable to what you see at redshift 2.8 and a bit below what people see at redshift 5.7, 6.5. So at this point, you know, there's so many um, uh, uh, properties that match Lyme and Alpha or galaxy properties that, that we said, hey, we've got um, uh, local analogs. Oh, I should stop here and say, uh, please interrupt if you have some question that, you know, something you're not following and a quick question that'll allow you to follow uh, further material. Um, to, actually, it'll keep me awake. I don't mind at all. And I won't be able to see hands. Uh, so just, just jump in. So um, I'll, skip. I'll skip this. And the great thing about green peas as opposed to high redshift uh, galaxies is that we have a whole slew of other lines, not just Lyme and alpha, but we have H alpha, which at high redshifts uh, moves out of convenient observing range for us ground-based observers. And so we have H alpha, we have other metal lines like oxygen two, oxygen three and all of this. So, Starting with H alpha, what can we do when we compare with H alpha? So here's, uh, here's this, some of the radiative transfer modeling we did, which lets, you know, which tells us how Lyman alpha escapes. As I said before, just to remind, Lyman alpha is a resonantly scattered line. So the green is H alpha, which we'll take as what the kin original kinematics of Lyman alpha was before it was radiatively scattered. And blue is what we see the Lyman alpha to be in for the same objects. And it's plotted as velocity plots. So you see a range of scattered behavior. And we did uh, model fitting. The models were uh, Max Gronke's radiative transfer models. So blue curve is a Blue is the data now, and green is uh, the the what came out of the radiative transfer models, and that gives us some information of what might be going on in each case. And from those radiative transfer model, we get how much Lyman alpha escapes, uh, and then uh, what are the kinematics of uh, you know the blue peak and the red peak. Basically, going back just for the basics. Uh, what we have is, um, uh, let's go back one more. So green is what the H alpha kinematics is, uh, ki uh, the kinematics of the H2 regions are. And uh, let's say the Lyman alpha photon started with the same sort of kinematic profile. And then uh, what happens is those photons scatter off like um, atoms, you ion, um, you know, neutral gas, a neutral H1 absorbs those photons and then there's nothing else for those photons to do. They get re-emitted in a different uh, direction and velocity. So they scatter around until they get out of resonance. So they either blue shift or they red shift. And then they don't scatter so much and they are able to escape. So that's the basics of the kinematics there. And um, we can um, model that um, by radiative transfer models, and that gives us some information on what's going on. So here's just a basic sort of correlate everything with that of everything sort of thing. Um, how much does Lyman alpha escape and how much does it depend on kinematics and uh, how much does it depend on the mass of the galaxies? and how much uh, dust there is. So the higher escaping uh, Lyman alpha is for galaxies that don't have too much dust as shown by reddening. They don't have too many metals. So metal poor galaxies, dust poor galaxies have a higher Lyman alpha escape. And that makes sense because as the photons scattered around, uh, uh, that increases their chance of being absorbed by dust. 
Okay, moving on. And from the models we get is, uh, another thing we get is what is the column density of neutral gas in the way of uh, the photons? Uh, and the lower the column density, um, the higher the chances of escape for most of the things. Some of these are outliers in their, um, but it's suspected to be AGN and that's a different kettle of fish altogether. Um, so these are very low column densities of neutral hydrogen. And you would think um, we were kind of uh, not very sensible then to go pursuing 21 centimeter emission from these galaxies. But the way we argued about it is uh, if we are seeing starbursts and we model the, um, the you know, optical uh, near infrared UV light of these galaxies, the spectral energy distribution. And the answer is these are very young star forming galaxies. They're about a few million years old, the starbursts in these galaxies. But there has to be fuel that, that uh, fuels this, these uh, starbursts. And so there has to be some H1. So if there's a starburst, there's got to be gas. So um, let's get back. So uh, I'll, I'll come back to 21 centimeters. So one of the things we try to do is let's let's see all let's throw in all of the factors: the mass, the the. Uh, lack of metallicity, the low metallicity, the lack of dust, and see if we can, and the kinematics, and see if we can uh, predict how much Lyman alpha would come out. So a principal component analysis as such. This is Juan Young's thesis, uh, part of his thesis in 2017. And then we were able to, so once there was a PCA analysis, we were able to um, predict um, the, predict the uh, expected Lyman alpha escape fraction uh, by using uh, two things. One is the velocity uh, displacement and the other is uh, the dust um, column densities. And we think we can apply this to higher redshift galaxies uh, when JWST comes out with the, uh, with the observations. Any day now, we, we are told, uh, we should be able to test these predictions and make better uh, use of reionization. But then uh, green peas are not Lyman alpha analogs and high redshift reionization. They're, they're, they're interesting galaxies for their own sakes. And one of the things we've been studying is um, how um, the star formation surface intensity uh, correlates with the fresh thermal pressure that you see in the H2 regions coming uh, using uh, the sulfur two lines. And this is uh, Tian Ching Jiang's uh, paper uh, 2019. We'll skip another one. And um, and then we also derived mass metallicity relations uh, in in a in this similar uh, paper that's that's her PhD thesis the paper is not yet published, where we see um, the mass metallicity relation for green peas is pretty flat, uh, and this has been seen in other emission line galaxies also, and um, um, it it um, it's different from what has been found or quote unquote normal higher mass galaxies where uh, there is a definite mass metallicity correlation. And Tianqing also gave better calibration for what the metallicity, uh, the uh, R23 relations could be by using uh, the direct temperature metallicity. Um, the other thing I've, uh, so far implied but not shown very um, uh, clearly is that many of the uh, green pea galaxies have been found to have high uh, escape of 
Lyman continuum uh, light. That is the uh, photons that are shorter than 911 angstroms, therefore able to ionize the surrounding gas. This is the sort of holy grail that people have been seeking for a long time in nearby galaxies. And it seems like uh, Lyman alpha, uh, Lyman, excuse me, green pea galaxies uh, show a high uh, continuum escape. This is a slightly dated figure. This is one with 70% escape too. And um, the Lyman continuum escape seems to correlate with uh, uh, any galaxy that has a high fraction of Lyman alpha escaping also have, has a high fraction of Lyman continuum escape also. So we could take one as a substitute for another if we can't uh, observe Lyman continuum escape directly. Uh, okay, so I'll segue into H1 observations, uh, which we've been doing with the Green Bank Telescope uh, and uh, did uh, some with Arecibo et al. And this paper is coming out soon. These are some of the, um, just a subset, a random subset of what the spectra look like. Um, these are galaxies going from redshift point 0 0.02 to 0.45 and so on and so forth. So what did the, uh, we observed 40 such galaxies and uh, got 21 centimeter detections in 21 or so. No, sorry, 19 of these galaxies and upper limits in the other. What, and I'll go through some of the highlights of these. Um, this is a plot from Hanukkah et al. coming to an astro pH near you pretty soon. And basically what's being plotted is the hydrogen mass on Y axis and stellar mass on the X axis. And this blue curve is the X gas medians. And in terms of stellar mass, the uh, green P galaxies, uh, the stellar max masses are from Tianqing's uh, Jiang's thesis from the mass metallicity relations. And you'll see that the masses get to pretty low masses. And still uh, H1 is detected in about half of them. So we were targeting to get the median uh, masses and, and we do get the median masses. Um, we do get, uh, we did get detections in about half of the galaxies we targeted. So that's, as expected, um, it looks like the the M star H one mass relation continues sort of uh, from the X gas sample to uh, the green P samples. But if you look at the um, star formation rate and um, what the depletion time for the H one would be. The depletion time for H1 in, in PNP galaxies is about um, is about a factor of 10 lower than the X gas median. That's the median depletion time. Remember, we didn't uh, detect uh, H1 in about half of them. The other Two results to note, uh, which are we kind of more tentative about them, but um, is that they seem to be more. If you take the mass of H one versus absolute blue magnitude relation that's calibrated to the quote unquote normal galaxies from Dennis et al. twenty fourteen. Here's the here's the relation and plus minus one sigma. And we see more galaxies that are above one sigma and below one sigma, both detections and upper limits. And uh, for the ones that are below one sigma, we, we, are, we should be able to count the upper limits as well. And it looks like there are more outliers by a factor of two or three than there should be. And that means maybe there's 
some interesting stuff going on we expect in low mass galaxies, there should be the boom and bust economy. So you get some uh, neutral gas excreted and you have a starburst and then boom, you uh, blow out the gas uh, pretty soon. So we're either seeing them in the boom phase or the bust phase and um, catching few of them uh, in the in-between phases. But again, the, the number densities are low enough and we're also missing CO. Uh, so we can't, we shouldn't be making, um, you know, huge claims about those. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to show you was, uh, the other thing that again, it's tentative is um, if we take um, our detection fraction for uh, sources which have high O3 over O2, which means they're highly ionized, the ionization radiation, ionizing radiation is high or um, very hard, maybe younger galaxies. There we see a low, uh, fewer detections than we see in the other galaxies. Again, this is small number statistics or could be because of some other, um, um, this could be a secondary correlation following uh, something else. Uh, so we won't make a huge claim about it, but it's something interesting to know. Um, maybe with, a, with larger samples, we can get better handle on this. And then uh, the, uh, in attractions to come, um, we have, uh, we're trying to do a comparison between the Lyman Alpha um, observations that uh, either we or someone else uh, have done and are in the HS, uh, HST COS archives where we can do Lyman Alpha uh, observations, whether they're um, absorption uh, features uh, such as in this galaxy or emission features like this galaxy. Um, and we have uh, observations of uh, 21 centimeter. Uh, so we're trying to do um, what is it uh, what is the comparison? Are they, um, does 21 centimeter detection means uh, we won't see Lyman alpha because uh, the neutral gas column density is high or, um, or is it, is the escape of Lyman alpha agnostic to what the 21 centimeter is doing? Um, and the answer is not clear at the moment. Um, the, the sample size where, where there's both Lyman alpha and uh, Lyman alpha spectroscopy and there is 21 centimeter observations uh, is, is kind of small and um, the statistics are uh, four of each, like uh, yes to Lyman alpha emission, no to 21 centimeter, yes to Lyman alpha emission, yes to 21 centimeter, so if you, uh, you get the picture. But um, then we are also doing morphological, uh, it's also worth looking at the morphology. This is the UV morph image of uh, one of the sources where we see both Lyman alpha, strong Lyman alpha escape and 21 centimeter. And it looks more complicated than some of the other sources where there's uh, that in, oops, sorry, let me try again. So this object where there's both Lyman alpha and 21 centimeters looks like, uh, looks like a more uh, complicated object than this one where you see Lyman alpha absorption and you see a strong 21 centimeter and there's only one strong UV uh, star forming region, uh, super star cluster or something similar. So this is work that's still uh, undergoing and uh, 
be good to see what's happening. Um, more data is always welcome, but we have something. Uh, we have about half a dozen sources that we can study nicely at the moment. So I'll, how much time do you have? Oh, I have 10 more minutes, but I'd like to get really good, uh, lots of questions. So I will put up my conclusions for now. And uh, yes, I have to go through them. Um, green peas and then the lower range of samples uh, that Juan found are called blueberries are good analogs of Lyman alpha galaxies. They have high escape fractions of Lyman alpha as well as Lyman continuum. They have low metallicities, compact sizes, low dust extinction, young stellar population ages, a few million years, low stellar masses, high gas pressures. These are all seen uh, with, uh, for high redshift Lyman alpha galaxies. They also have high escape fraction for ionizing radiation, the kind of, so these are the kind of galaxies responsible for reionization. And um, green peas give us a great opportunity to study those in details with, for, uh, for their H1 uh, emission the, uh, properties, their CO emission properties, and things like that. Things that we can't do for high redshift sources right now. Or in case of ALMA, we have been doing for CO and C plus uh, at high redshift. So there'll be, stay tuned for more 21 centimeter and H1, 21 centimeter H1 and Chandra observations. And I will stop here and open the floor for questions. Thank you for your attention. All right. And thank you very much, um, Sangeeta. Um, so uh, I'll open up to questions, but uh, actually first I did want to ask one of my own. So you, sure. you, you mentioned that you have about a dozen sources um, for studying right now. Is that correct? So I said about uh, a handful that have both uh, UV spectroscopy that can do Lyman alpha absorption and emission and 21 centimeters. Okay. That, yeah. Compared, how does that compare to the number of sources that have been, uh, the number of green pea galaxies that have been identified through the citizen science work? So the citizen science work, okay. So that's a kind of, uh, a more complicated question. I think the Cardamoni paper had about 60. And then um, Juan and Tianqing between them went through, combed through the uh, Sloan database and identified about a thousand um, mm -hmm. with the uh, criterion of equivalent width of oxygen three greater than such and so basically. And compact sizes, same criterion and then um, and then uh, we followed up uh, with Green Bank and Arecibo about 60. Uh, 20 were lost to RFI, 20 were uh, detected. No, 19 were detected, 21 were not detected. Uh, the class archives have about 60 or so in the archives. So there's Venn diagrams all over the place. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Yes, hi. Very interesting talk. Um, looking at your summary slides, it sounds as if these galaxies somehow got detached from the rest of evolution, uh, galaxy evolution at a fairly early time. Yeah, so it, it looks like uh, the star formation has been very recent, but these are not metal poor, they're, I mean, they're not metal free, they're metal poor. So they must have been a prior episode of star formation. I mean, one of the interesting things would be to go look for, um, you know, the, the old stars. Uh, mm -hmm. Every time we do the calculation of what needs to be done, we kind of uh, go, oh my God, this is gonna be hard uh, because the light is dominated by the end stars. But there must have been a previous boom and bust episode, uh, which drove out part of the metals 
that that's my opinion which is mm -hmm. i can't quantify and rigorously prove so sorry you were going somewhere no i wasn't i was just i mean you just given an explanation that these were galaxies that somehow lost all their gas or at least a large fraction yeah. of it so star formation ceased for a long time yeah so so lo we expect low mass galaxies to have these uh you know you can massive stars in supernovae can drive out winds at velocities that lets them escape uh the, the lets the gas and metals escape uh, uh so that's what we think it's happening they're also not super um They're not super isolated or super um, clustered. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just had a follow-up question. This is David. Uh, in terms of the large Lyman Alpha line whiffs, I, that really struck me. They're very large. Um, so, I mean, is that interpreted as just due to the outflows? So something cleared the channels, uh, and. Uh, a lot, this, that allows slime and alpha to escape. So if you, um, I've been staring at these things for too long, but if, if you see some of the, okay, here it is. If you look at the escape fraction and the escape fraction we get is assume case B and what the H alpha flux should be versus what the lime and alpha flux should be. Um, so, and then we compare with what Lyman alpha flux we see, you see the escape fraction is, is low in, is, is high in cases where the, the displacement of the uh, red peak and blue peak is low, right? Yeah, well. And what then, so okay. what that means is that, uh, you know, it's, it's not like, so something has cleared the channel. So the column density of neutral gas is not so much. So uh, you could you could have lime and alpha just come out cleanly, or you could have lime and alpha have to displace to a lot of um, out of resonance a lot in order to come out. And in the latter case, not much of it comes out. So you're saying there should have been outflows. Yes, there should have been outflows which cleared the channels. Um, but the other problem with these outflows and I'm stirring up a whole hornet's nest here is these are uh, galaxies, the stellar ages seem to be a few 10 to the six. So a whole, not a whole lot of supernovae have gone off. So it's possible that a lot of uh, this is through stellar winds. So uh, sort of continuing from that, considering their, their compact size, I presume these galaxies have not uh, undergone any interactions, strong interactions with others. Do I have that slide which shows the whole rogues gallery? Oops, no. Uh, So in Juan's paper, there's a slide that shows a whole rogues gallery of the blueberry galaxies, the UV uh, things, and uh, with with the HST resolution, and that uh, that shows some that have interactions, but not all. So most of them look like this: one concentrated uh, UV region, and that um, that is. Uh, of the order of 300 parsecs or so. And I uh, did the wrong thing again, sorry. Um, I should do the back button and not the... So most of them look like this, this uh, thing right here, but some of them look like this. Yes, there's some that are interacting. Most of them are compact with one peak dominating. Right. Okay, and 
you don't notice much um, distinction between the groups. We haven't studied it yet. Okay. It's the right answer. Okay, that's very interesting. Um, so uh, we're getting close to the time. I think we have the option for one more question. If anyone in the audience would like to ask Sangeeta. Going once, going twice. All right, then it looks like everybody has asked what they need to, but if not, you can always get in contact with Dr. Sangeeta. Um, and yeah, I would like to thank you one last time for giving us this talk. It's great. Thanks, Jesse, for inviting me and great fun to talk to all of you. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Take care and everyone have a good rest of your week.